Hello my friends and welcome back to the rabbit hole. Today's video is indeed going to be all about choosing a cleanser and active ingredients in cleansers. Was the thumbnail something that suggests my frustration? Because if so, that was not clickbait where to start with this video. So tomorrow's video is indeed going to be a big video covering a lot of different cleansers. And I, I came to the realization that this needs to be a separate video. There's very simply not enough uh, information on this topic. There's not enough answers to are the ingredients in my cleanser actually absorbing into my skin, which is why we're sitting down to make this today. I have to start today's video in such an odd place that I don't actually like to bring up, but it's very relevant for today's video. So my background is indeed in research, not in skincare research. It is in the field of nutrition, just so you know, not saying I'm a skincare expert. But I think that does help to explain why, for me, when I'm talking about skincare products, I always have citations, I always go to the primary literature. It's very important for me to draw from the science, to draw from, you know, double-blind, randomized studies as opposed to just manufacturer claims on products, right? And the reason I'm bringing this up is that I plan to do this with cleansers today. I thought we would go to the primary literature, get some quick and easy answers, and report back. And as some of you know, given that I promised this video in early September and it is now well into October, it has been a lot more difficult of a question to answer. And one of the biggest problems that I'm seeing is a lack of actually drawing from the science and instead drawing from logic. Now logic isn't an inherently uh, wrong way to see things, but in the sciences, if you're drawing from logic, that would be your hypothesis. You would need to test your hypothesis in order to call it science. And specifically in researching cleanser, this is where I discovered there's a lot of reliance on logic because there isn't necessarily a lot of published literature on these active ingredients specifically in cleansers. It would not be scientific at all to take the data that we have on an ingredient in a Levon product and apply it to a cleanser. But what if there's a lack of data and yet there's a need for answers? Well, that puts us in a bit of a gray area, which is where I feel we are with cleansers. And in today's video, I'm gonna do my darn best to break this down further for you. I wanna start today's video out with what people do know or what they've heard about active ingredients and ingredients as a whole in cleansers. So there seem to be two kind of uh, competing notions within the skincare world regarding cleansers. One is, and you'll hear this all the time, fragrance is okay in a cleanser because it's not left on your skin long enough to fully absorb. And yet somehow the same people that say those things are also saying a BHA-based cleanser or a benzoyl peroxide cleanser may be effective for helping to treat or prevent acne. Wait just a second. How are you gonna say some ingredients are sitting there not absorbing in a cleanser and yet others work in a cleanser? Wait, what? And that's what we have to break down. How can both of those statements be true? And the short version of the story here is because it depends on every single ingredient that you're talking about in your cleanser. Now, like I said, because there's so many people who want answers on this topic and yet we don't have all the data, we are kind of forced to start this video out with the logical perspective. And of course we can make these logical statements based on scientific data and scientific knowledge. So what's a good starting place for ingredients in a cleanser? How can we know that ingredients in a cleanser might possibly penetrate into your skin as opposed to be washed down the drain? Well, one thing we could look at is the solubility. If we're talking about active ingredients that are oil soluble, there's a pretty decent chance those might stay on your skin. What about water-soluble ingredients? For example, L-ascorbic acid, vitamin C. Well, if we're applying water-soluble ingredients to our skin, massaging it onto our skin and then rinsing, where's the water going? down the drain. Whereas oil-soluble ingredients won't be washed away in that rinsing with water step that we all do in cleansing our skin. There's actually pretty good data to support this as well. We have data that oils do absorb in that cleansing step. For example, if you have jojoba oil in a cleanser, it's probably absorbing into your skin. 
And back to the water soluble ingredients, if you're somebody who is uh, purchasing bulk L ascorbic acid and you're mixing it into your cleanser and you think you are a DIY chemist over there, a DIY wizard making your own L ascorbic face wash, you're probably washing it all down the drain. But wait a minute, L ascorbic acid cleansers exist. If solubility is everything, then how can those products possibly exist? you could actually turn to something called encapsulation. Now, I'm sure if you have been into skincare for any length of time, you've seen encapsulated on your products, encapsulated retinol, encapsulated vitamin C. You could hypothetically do that with an l based cleanser. But we run into a bit of an issue in that how do you know your cleanser, your LAA cleanser, is encapsulated? Well, I suppose it's like how you know if somebody's vegetarian or not. They'll tell you. Don't worry, I'm making fun of myself. Vegetarian for 13 years. They'll probably tell you, or at least they might tell you, but if they don't, you're kind of out of luck. Because the catch with encapsulation for you as a consumer is that you cannot look at the inky and find the ingredients that will indicate that ingredient is encapsulated. Even if you were somebody who formulates skincare and you're very familiar with those ingredients, they're not just limited to the encapsulation. They could also be there for a variety of different reasons. Again though, all of this is a logical perspective. In order to actually make this data-driven, to make this scientific, we would have to run studies on that ingredient, that encapsulated ingredient now, in a cleanser. And while we've done that to a limited extent with l acid, what about the vitamin C derivatives? Well, that's where we're really running into some issues. When we talk about other water-soluble derivatives of vitamin C, do we really know that those are absorbing into your skin at all? Do we know that the encapsulation is working for those ingredients? We really don't. Okay, but solubility isn't everything. Correct, it's not. We could certainly go off about charge. We can go off about mechanism. In fact, let's actually pause to talk about mechanism. When we're talking about each active ingredient, we have to talk about how it works. Does it work very quickly or does it take time to work? So for example, antimicrobials can immediately come in and wipe out bacteria. If any of you happen to see that video of uh, isopropyl alcohol just wiping out bacteria. Thus, if your mechanism for your active ingredient is something that can happen instantly, sorry, I can't snap. <laughs> if it can happen instantly, then a cleanser may be a sufficient delivery system as even though it's only on the skin for a short period of time, it's able to get its job done, so to speak. But we have one more really important logical conclusion with cleanser, and that is basically summarized by saying, we suppose that when you put these ingredients into a cleanser, which is only on your skin for a short period of time, there's probably a reduction in the performance of those ingredients, in the effectiveness. Perhaps a cleanser with 2% salicylic acid might perform like a leave-on product with salicylic at 0.5% which I feel I can anecdotally confirm, but again, we are basing this on logic and we really do need to turn to the science itself. So let's do that next. In order to speak with confidence from a scientific perspective, we need to look at every single ingredient in a cleanser format. And how do we collect that data? Well, there's quite a few options. One is we could do double-blind, randomized, controlled trials with every single ingredient, but let's be honest, that is going to be expensive, time-consuming, and there's a lot of ingredients that we technically should do this with. You could also use spectroscopy, but again, I think this is another one of those areas where I don't think people know how much this costs. It's kind of funny, something I think about and I kind of do mention a lot is that I love how people are getting an interest in the sciences as a result of skincare. But nonetheless, please do not think that going on Amazon and buying pH test strips is the same as running spectroscopy on sunscreens. The price isn't even remotely close. Unless you're Elon Musk, then it might be relatively close for you. Because of the high costs, I'm also going to go ahead and mention you could hypothetically do animal studies. 
But let me just take a quick moment here to say I am not in favor of animal studies at all. I have never done them and I never will. I feel like I have a very uh, annoying perspective, if I'm just being honest with you. I feel like I do because I do know how much it costs to do human studies because that's what I did. It's, it's millions, by the way. It's millions. For one study. For one study. So you see what I'm saying? It's very expensive. So I do understand why people turn to animal studies, but, you know, the problem with that is they just... They're just useless. In doing the research for this video, I was coming across studies that, oh, there's so many studies on pig skin, and we still don't, are, are we pigs? Are we pigs? But I even found studies that were attempting to answer the question of absorption with furry rats. Are you kidding? Are you kidding me? You must be kidding me. Oh, we're pretty much at our wits end here with trying to figure out how we'll do this, right? Well, guess what? I've actually got one more possible answer for you. And this is a study I found on benzoyl peroxide where they actually used human cadavers to measure absorption. We might need a lot of cadavers to study every one of these ingredients, although I did recently watch Squid Game. So at this point in the video, you likely see that we have a problem of a lack of data. If we barely have data on vitamin C in cleansers, let me tell you something, we definitely do not have the data on whether these fancy cleansers that are selling you kale and berries in your cleanser, we have no idea if that's absorbing into your skin. And again, I emphasize if you're somebody who's using a cleanser with these fancy fancy ingredients and you like it, that is a-okay. But from a strictly scientific perspective, yeah, we don't know if those ingredients are absorbing. We do not have data on kale, on berries, on, on fairies, in fact. And those magical beans could be absorbing into your skin, but we don't know. Fairies in your skincare actually kind of summarizes way too much of skincare, doesn't it? So what scientific data do we actually have on these active ingredients? Well, we actually have a pretty decent body of literature on the ingredient benzoyl peroxide. And again, we not only have that data, but it does make logical sense via the mechanism of benzoyl peroxide. In fact, you may do better like I do with benzoyl peroxide in a cleanser simply because you're going to experience less of the irritation. Again, coming back to that point that we may actually see a bit of a reduction in potency of these ingredients via a cleanser format, but hey, you can use that to your benefit. If you're somebody that can't use these ingredients in a leave-on product, it may work out really well for you in a cleanser. We also do have some data on salicylic acid, which again, also an oil-soluble ingredient, so it not only makes sense, but we do have some data. I think the uh, perhaps the reason why we're seeing more research into the ingredients that target acne is because acne is a medical condition. And it certainly gets a lot more fuzzy when we get into active ingredients that do things other than help with acne. So when it comes to L-ascorbic acid, we do have limited data on it. Again, it would need to be encapsulated in order to work. And that's something that you're just going to have to figure out yourself, potentially ask companies, but it's very strange to that they don't seem to want to advertise that as it is a critical component of having a successful uh, L-ascorbic cleanser. With vitamin C derivatives, listen, they are a great idea in theory. I personally do like them in practice, but I'm going to be honest with you, we have limited data for these ingredients, even in a leave-on format. We definitely do not have it in a cleanser. Now check this one out. This is actually uh, one of my best examples in this whole dang video. Thank you so much, Elf. This is their Super Clarify cleanser right here. Now uh, take a look at this packaging with me here. A cleanser with clarifying niacinamide. Oh my god, it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. We don't have data on niacinamide's effectiveness in a cleanser. But is this cleanser even claiming that the niacinamide is doing anything in it? Or is it just simply a cleanser, period? With niacinamide a clarifying ingredient, we don't know if it clarifies in this cleanser because we don't have data on niacinamide. But hey, it is a cleanser with clarifying niacinamide. <sighs> Question for you all, do you see that as deceptive or do you think that's actually just really simply good marketing? This cleanser has an upcoming career in politics. And that brings us to some final thoughts on this whole topic. How do you, how do you choose a cleanser? Especially now knowing that there's not a lot of data on the active ingredients in cleansers aside from the acne treatments. Well, thankfully we're not completely out of studies because there are studies that have looked at just basic cleansers. And you know what they find? They find that the most important elements of choosing a cleanser are 
number one, gentle surfactants. You don't need to be using harsh surfactants. Your cleanser shouldn't leave your skin feeling dry after you use it. And number two, a skin-friendly pH. Specifically, this particular study says a pH of 5.5 is optimal. Gone are the days of using harsh soap ingredients at a pH of 10 to wash our face. We know that that is not optimal for your skin. You should go lower with the pH. You don't have to go super low, but 5.5 is pretty good. And after a month of reading about all this, you know, I gotta say, I actually am not disappointed in our end conclusion here because what it really comes down to is whether your cleanser is expensive or inexpensive, it doesn't actually matter. There are many things in life where having more money gives you an advantage, but uh, cleansers is not one of them. I recently watched Squid Game. It is my most sincere hope that this video was helpful to you. It is my most sincere hope that I managed to condense all of that into something that makes sense. But yeah, the take home is uh, just use a basic cleanser. Perhaps we can encourage companies to do more research if they are going to make exaggerated claims on cleanser. I would love to see it. I hope this video was helpful. Again, do stay tuned for tomorrow when we talk all about cleansers. And if you found this video helpful, make sure to give it a like, hit that subscribe button, and I will see you all next time.